given the other students before. And we will definitely talk about that, not just myocardial infarction, but we'll factor in unstable angina because that also forms part of um, the acute coronary syndromes. So I like starting off with the case. Uh, this is a, a, a patient we had a couple of years ago, a 57-year-old male who presented with left-sided chest pain for a, a day, less than 24 hours of sudden onset. And according to him, it was while he was seated. This pain was on the left side radiating to the left arm, to the left jaw as well. And it was unprovoked. And this was the first time he had had such severe pain. It was associated with sweating. Uh, there was no similar pain previously, like I mentioned. He was a non-smoker. He was not diabetic, not hypertensive, and seemed to be lean. And apparently, he was also somebody who used to exercise quite regularly. So the next picture is not of the patient, the actual patient himself. Oh, sorry. Uh, but this is an example of uh, a patient you might have, and I want to draw your attention to the eyes. You see those lesions around the eyes? Those are due to hypercholesterolemia. It's called xanthelasma. So that can be an indication of uh, a problem with the lipids, having too high lipids that could lead to what we think he had, which was a myocardial infarction. So the background for coronary artery disease is that there's, you have to know the, the distinction between ischemia and infarction. And I think when you did your pathology, you definitely learned about the difference between the two. Ischemia is reversible, infarction is not. So there's an imbalance between the oxygen supply and the de demand. So this time, because we're talking about the, the heart and the myocardium, there is a, an imbalance between the supply of blood to a part of the myocardium. So the oxygen supply and nutrient supply is compromised and the demand there is high. So when that happens, you might get ischemia, which is irreversible, which is just uh, some form of hypoxic injury to the, to, 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 to the distal tissues. But uh, once you correct the cause, the tissues are normal. They haven't... Uh, undergone necrosis, which is what happens in infarction. So when you're talking about myocardial infarction, it's irreversible myocardial injury resulting in necrosis, usually secondary to occlusion of a coronary artery. You know, we have three coronary arteries that supply the whole of the heart. There's the right, then there's the left main stem, which will branch into two. There's a circumflex artery, and then there's also the left anterior descending, and those also have got their own branches. So when there's a blockage in any one of those, then you can get an acute coronary syndrome. So as I mentioned, when you talk about acute coronary syndromes, it involves unstable angina, and we're going to talk about the distinction when you're doing you're taking your history, and uh, myocardial infarction, which could be uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI, or non-ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction, which we call an NSTEMI. So the difference between the two is that in, in one, there's ST elevation on the ECG. In the other, there is not. There might be other changes like maybe T-wave invasions, or it might even look like a normal ECG, uh, but there's no ST elevation, and that is also a type of myocardial infarction. So this is just a reminder of the anatomy, like I mentioned. These are your coronaries. They are the first branches of the aorta. This is the right coronary artery going to the right side and also to the inferior portion of the heart through the PDA, okay, posterior descending artery. And then that's your left main stem, which branches into the circumflex. It goes through the groove on the lateral side of the heart. And then this goes to the anterior wall, which is there left anterior descending artery. I'm sure you'll remember this anatomy very well. So the underlying pathology in coronary artery disease is that uh, you have atherosclerosis. So this is a normal blood vessel. Okay, we'll assume that this is a, a coronary artery. 
with the nice layers and endothelium, the tunica media, and then you got the adventitia and on the outside. Here in the endothelial surface, it's very nice and smooth. There's no collection of atheromatous material as it is in this picture. So in atherosclerosis, you have risk factors for developing atherosclerosis, like maybe a chronic smoker, hyperlipidemia, as in, is the case in our patient, or maybe the patient is diabetic. So within the coronary artery, within the coronary, within the walls, you get uh, general inflammation, okay? And then you also have these macrophages which engulf the lipid-rich material, forming foam cells. Within that debris, there's also lipids and also calcium. And then a fibrous cap to protect it is formed at the top. So when this happens, of course, the lumen of the coronary becomes compromised, narrowed. So in the initial stages, the patient might present with the angina, which could be stable. So stable angina just means that when, for instance, when you're taking your history, you ask the patient, when, when you have this chest, when do you have this chest pain? Is it related to exercise? When climbing upstairs, when you walk a long distance and you get pain in your chest, then when you rest, you feel better, Okay. And then when you take things like nitrates, in case they had been seen by another doctor and they take, gave them nitrates to use, it also relieves the pain. So it's relieved by rest and relieved also by nitrates. Sometimes a patient might not have taken any medication. So you just rely on the fact that the pain might be relieved by rest. So if that is the case, then you're most likely dealing with a, a milder form of angina, a stable angina, okay? However, if the pain, the chest pain, occurs at rest, if it occurs at rest and provoked, then that is unstable angina, okay? Then there's also another type of angina called prince metal, prince metal uh, as angina. That is due to vasospasms, coronary vasospasms, but that doesn't form acute coronary syndrome. So unstable angina, is different from myocardial infarction in that in unstable angina, there is just ischemia, not yet infarction, okay? So if you did tests on these patients, there will be no leakage of myocardial proteins in the blood. That happens when there is infarction. So you will see a patient, they give you that history, you do your investigations, you do an ECG, it's looking, not looking bad, looking normal, maybe there's some T-wave invasions, you check your cardiac enzymes and they are negative, then most likely, yes, they are dealing with unstable angina, but that is still an emergency. It means that you haven't gone into infarction yet. If the patient has got pain, chest pain, severe at rest, crushing chest pain, typical chest pain for angina, and then you do investigations on the ECG, you see maybe ST elevations, or maybe they are not there, but you do your cardiac enzymes, and you find that your troponins and your CKMB, for instance, are high, then it means that that myocardium has become infected. So the proteins from the myocardium are leaking into the blood and you can detect it. I hope that makes things clear. So that plaque can be a stable one, as shown here where it's, it's covered by this fibr fibrous capsule. But that capsule can, can rupture. It may, come, may become compromised due to stress within the, the blood vessel. And when that happens, you get a, a, a clot forming within the vessel, which occludes the vessel completely. And that is what causes your myocardial infarction. It's so important to know the components of this uh, or to know the pathophysiology of this disease because then it dictates treatment and it also explains why you treat things the way you do and we'll talk about that briefly though I know you're at fifth year level that it's important for you to know briefly just how we treat such cases okay so that's there atherosclerosis narrowing of a coronary artery you can get either ischemia as in in angina stable or unstable but because we are talking about acute coronary syndromes we're going to concentrate on unstable angina. 
And then you also have infection on this side, which can be an ST elevation MI, or it could be a non-ST elevation MI, okay? So the risk factors, this is something that when you're taking your history, you have to be able to elicit very clearly. But bear in mind that because these are emergencies, according to what they teach you, they tell you to take a history first, do a physical examination, and then you do your investigations and then treat. That's the order of doing things. But if a patient comes as an emergency with crushing chest pain and is unstable, you will be doing all these things at the same time because now you're dealing with an emergency. So while you are trying to stabilize the patient, you are taking your history. You are taking a brief and focused history. But for fifth year, you should know all the key components of things that you're supposed to ask. So it's important for you to identify risk factors. Some patients might not have any risk factors, but most of them do. So the majority are due to maybe lifestyle diseases, modifiable risk factors like smoking. Is this a chronic smoker? You ask how long has the patient been smoking? Have you, how long have you been smoking? What do you smoke? How many packets per day? And then you ask also a history of diabetes because this could be a patient who is a non-diabetic patient. Ask for history of hypertension. Sometimes these are diagnosed at the time when they have the MI. And then also ask if they had never had the cholesterol checked and if it was high. You will also have to elicit for risk factors like obesity. And now uh, it's actually important to also talk about drugs which could be interfere with lipid metabolism, like uh, some ARTs called protease inhibitors can cause dyslipidemia and predispose a patient to myocardial infarction. And that is what our patient actually had. He had been on PIs, had dyslipidemia, and then developed the myocardial infarction. Then there are non-modifiable risk factors like age. So patients who are above the age of 45, for instance, are typically the ones who develop atherosclerosis. These days, we're also seeing myocardial infarction in, in, in patients who have co are post-COVID or have COVID and are young. But that's a, a, a rarity, at least from the ones that we have seen. And the pathophysiology is slightly different because there it's just about clot formation without atherosclerosis and inflammation as the underlying cause for their myocardial infarction. Then sex. Males tend to be predominant when it comes to coronary artery disease. Though in postmenopausal women, the risk in women becomes the same as men. Okay, so the risk is the same in postmenopausal females. Then you also have to ask, this is so important, family history. In your family, did anybody die suddenly without you knowing the cause? Because that puts them at high risk. In your family, has anybody had a myocardial infarction? Has anybody ever had a stroke? Because the risk factors overlap. So you have to elicit that history. So we've already talked about some of the clinical features, but I'll talk about them still. So you have to take a detailed history as you are stabilizing them, okay? They would complain of acute, if it's, if it's an emergency in acute coronary syndromes, unstable angina or a myocardial infarction, they, will com they may complain of chest pain, which could be substernal or on the left side of the chest, so in the area overlying the heart, radiating to the left arm, and to the jaw. It might be related to exercise or not. It might be present at rest. Okay. And also it is relieved when they are resting. So if the patient has had symptoms for a long time, but never sought help and then comes with a full-blown uh, myocardial infarction, before that they might tell you that actually I, I couldn't climb upstairs. Whenever I did, I would get this pain or downness, the dull ache in my chest squeezing pain sometimes, and breathlessness. And then, of course, if you give nitrates, that's also, and it, and it relieves the pain, that could also point you to angina as the underlying cause of their chest pain. So there might also be associated nausea, depending on the type of MI you have, like if you have an inferior MI, excessive sweating, in some patients, they might not even give you a history of chest pain. It might be epigastric pain. So 
always watch out for atypical presentations of MI. And then chest tightness as well, or pressure in the chest. Then they might also come in just with, with, the, with acute pulmonary edema. So they are very breathless, at rest, their respiratory rate is high, they're using accessory muscles of respiration. You auscultate the chest and all you're hearing is very fine crepitations throughout the lung fields or even in the bases. Then you suspect pulmonary edema. And when, when you try to discover or to investigate why the patient has got pulmonary edema, then uh, you discover that uh, the patient had an MI as the underlying cause. Then in diabetics, diabetics are a bit special because sometimes coronary artery disease does not present the way it does in normal pay persons. For instance, uh, if they have autonomic dysregulation, it means that as a complication of their diabetes, autonomic dysfunction, it means that their pain sensitivity is low, so they might not have the chest pain. It might actually have be a silent MI. You find the patient comes in with breathlessness and all that is diabetic. You investigate them, you do cardiac enzymes, you do an ECG, you see that the ST elevation is there and the cardiac uh, enzymes and proteins are positive. So they would have had what we call a silent myocardial infarction. Okay. And then in some patients, depending on how large this infarction is, especially if it involves the left main stem, for instance, before the two branches, it means that the whole of the anterior and the lateral wall of the myocardium has become infected. If that happens, then the patient might present in shock, okay, and hemodynamically unstable. So you check the BP, it is low in a patient with chest pain like that, then you know that you have to act quickly to, to, to treat them. So the investigations that you can do for these patients while you're stabilizing them is if you can do an ECG, very important, because then you see some changes on the ECG. Uh, ST and T wave invasions, for instance. I don't know if you, in physiology you did uh, something on ECG, did you? Or were you taught? Can anyone answer, please? We were introduced to the ECG. Pardon? We were introduced to the ECG. You were introduced to it. Okay, great. That's what I wanted to know. So you have to learn a little bit more about the ECG. And if we had time, I had actually planned to teach the ECG more than just concentrating on bradycardias, but we'll see if, if, if we can even do that. I doubt it because we've lost so much time. So you do an ECG. You look at the ST and the T, T wave, they might be inverted, okay? But the ST segment is important because if it is elevated, then it's an ST elevation, myocardial infarction. Then you might have Q waves, which will indicate myocardial scar. It means that the infarction has gone beyond just necrosis now. We have even formed a scar. Or if you have a new left bundle branch block and there are other uh, ST elevation MI equivalents that will be probably at your level you don't really need to know, but just know the basics first and then you can add on later. So do an ECG right there in the emergency room, a 12 lead ECG to look at all, the, all aspects of the heart from the anterior wall to the inferior wall to the lateral wall, everywhere. The right ventricle as well might be infected, like if you have an inferior myocardial infarction, okay? So you look at the ECG in its entirety to make that diagnosis. Then you do a blood test called, called biomarkers. The one that we do that is very superior, has a high sensitivity and is quite, is very accurate, is the high sensitive, troponins. Remember the cardiac uh, myocytes, the proteins in it, they are troponins, aren't they? Myoglobins. Remember all those? So if there, if there is infection, these will leak into the blood and you'll be able to measure them when you, when you sample that blood and take it to the lab. 
Then the other enzymes creating kinase MB, okay, the isoenzyme MB is specific for the cardia, for the myocardium. These next two, these two are not specific for the, the myocardium. We actually even rarely do them, but you should know about them. There's lactate dehydrogenase there, and then there's AST, okay, which can also be elevated in liver disease. So these ones are not commonly done, but the ones that we do in all our patients we suspect has uh, an acute coronary syndrome is troponins and the CKMB, okay? Then, of course, we talked about uh, hyperlipidemia, so you should order a lipid profile. You should also do an echo if, if the patient is stable enough to have, uh, like in our setting, we move them because we don't have portable echo. But if you have portable echo, do an echo at the bedside because it's also important to see how the myocardium is contracting, if there are areas of echinacea or hypokinesia or a scar, if you can see a scar on the myocardium, and also to look at how the heart is functioning, if the pump function is okay, or if it is compromised, the patient might be at risk of developing heart failure, okay? You can do a chest X-ray in selected cases, especially if they have acute pulmonary edema. So it's not in all patients where you will prioritize a chest X-ray. Then a random blood sugar is also important to do in case yeah, it's a newly diagnosed diabetic or it's a diabetic patient who also has hyperglycemia and needs that treatment. Then the baseline test that you need to do is uh, full blood counts for all patients. That's important, especially our young patients. And then also check the renal function. This, the renal function is so important because some of the medications you'll be giving might compromise or worsen your renal function, okay? So like if you are going to give um, uh, thrombolytics and the patient has got uh, very high creatine in angeria, indicating there's renal dysfunction, you might increase the risk of bleeding. So you might go ahead and give it, but know that the risk is high of bleeding because there's also uremic bleeding which can result, okay? Then the coronary angiography actually should have come at the top but I put it down here because you might not get an angiography in the emergency setting in our place. But in the world over, when a patient comes in with an MI, the paramedics would have made that diagnosis. They would have started the treatment. They would have given thrombolytics while the patient is being transported to the hospital. They would have given chewable aspirin. They would have given the basic tests, nitrates and all that. And all they do is on the phone, uh, while in the ambulance, they call the hospital and tell them that there's this patient who we think has an MI who's coming in, activate the cat lab. So the cat lab gets activated at that point. By the time the patient is being wheeled in, the doctors are just confirming all the ECGs that have been done on the, on the, on the ambulance by the paramedics. They're just confirming the troponins, which can be a rapid test as well. It can be a then you just prick blood and then you, 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 you remove blood, sorry. You prick the patient, you remove blood and test right there and then and the troponins are high or they are positive. Then from there, when they are in the hospital, they are being taken straight to the cath lab for them to go and do a coronary angiogram to look at the coronaries, the injected dye within the coronaries to see where the blockage is so that that blockage can be opened up. And that is the best treatment for myocardial infarction, like what we call a percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI. Okay. So just know that this should probably come higher up there. So this is just uh, a diagram showing how after the onset of chest pain, Within what time frame will you get positive troponins? When will you get positive CKMB? And for how long does it last? So this is a very nice diagram. You should know about it because if you if you sampled the blood too early within the first four hours, you might see that the enzymes might be negative or the, the cardiac troponins might be negative. Meanwhile, the patient does have a myocardial infarction. But most of the times, the presentation is at around uh, four to six hours. So if it's an emergency case, they would have brought the patient early enough. But during that time, take the blood sample. 
But then if you, if it's negative and the suspicion is still high, repeat the sample after an hour or two, okay? You might get them positive. So the first one to rise is the myoglobins. We usually don't assay for myoglobins because they're not very stable. But the CKMB, I've already mentioned that it's one of the tests that we do routinely. It will remain positive and high for up to 36 hours. So by day three, it would have gone down. But the troponins remain elevated for up to seven days. So it goes beyond the 48 hour there. So even if the patient came two, three days later after the onset of the chest pain, and remember, oh, sorry, I didn't mention, I didn't emphasize this, but even when you're taking your history and they tell you I had chest pain, get the exact time when the chest pain started, if they can give it to you, or an approximation. So that you approximate that, okay, about four hours prior to presenting to hospital, that's when the pain started. Don't just say started yesterday or started. It's very important, the timing, because it's, 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 it helps you expect certain things at certain times. You anticipate them so that when you're getting your results, you can interpret them properly. So troponins remain high for up to seven days. So this is another diagram, probably a neater one showing the same thing, CKMB rises and then goes down by, 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 by day three. Okay. So if the patient, for instance, had a myocardial infarction, you treat it while they're in hospital day three, they have severe chest pain again. You check the CKMB by the time it's day four, the CKMB is high. Then you know that the patient has had another, what we call a reinfarction. Okay, so that's what we use to also check for reinfarction. The troponins would have been high anyway, so it might not be useful for you to do them because it would still be high, either because of the first episode or maybe also in combination with the second episode. So this is in a different language, so it's got a double A there, but just know this is a normal ECG. So remember, they, they are on the standard 12-lead ECG, the recording is for 12 leads. I hope you also had time to practice how to do an ECG when you were doing your physiology. So there's a lead, standard lead, limb leads, one, two, three, okay? Then the augmented limb, limb leads, the augmented leads, AVR, AVL, AV foot. And then these are the precordial or chest leads from V1 all the way to V6. So this is an example of a patient who had an MI, okay? It was taken at a different time after the ST elevation has started to come down. But what is so prominent here is these very deep symmetrical inverted T waves, which was not present in that normal ECG, all the way from the anterolateral wall. So they must be in the proximal LAD or left anterior descending. Maybe that is where the occlusion is in this myocardial infarction. The troponins and CKMB would be positive in such a patient. Here is another example. Don't know if you can pick out anything. It takes a while for you to get used to, to, to looking at ECGs, but this one is a bit different because here you see ST. Remember we said that either elevation or depression. So this one had an ST depression from V3, V4, V5, V6. The base is supposed to be here, but this segment from the S to the T is depressed. So if this patient's troponins and CKMB were positive, then this one would qualify as being an n STEMI or non-ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation, it's self-explanatory. It means there's no ST elevation, but the patient has got a myocardial infarction. That's what it means. Then now this one is an anterolateral ST elevation MI. So we're expecting to see ST elevations, okay? So, and there are the ST elevations, very prominent. Actually starts from lead one, AVL, these are lateral leads. Then these are anterior leads. So it's an anterior lateral from V1 all the way to V6. You see that elevation. 
it's different from the previous uh, ECG where there was depression like that. This one, there is elevation. And there are also what we call Q waves. So already a scar, the myocardial scar has started to form and the elevation is up there. So these leads look at the anterior lateral wall of the, of, of the, of the myocardium, ST elevation, okay? It's so important for you to get the nomenclature right because the way you will treat might be slightly different. For instance, if you have an ST elevation MI, that patient needs to go straight away to the cath lab. If you can't get them to the cath lab for a PCI agently, you then you need to agently give thrombolytics. Okay. So this is a patient, patient X. I'd like you to just look at the leads properly. We're concentrating more on the ST segments. Can you see here? Here, this is where the base should be, at the base of the P wave there. That's where the isoelectric line is. But where it's supposed to be at the isoelectric line, the ST segment is supposed to be at the isoelectric line, it's elevated. And this time around, it's elevated in different leads. It's not in the chest leads there. It's in two, three, and AV foot. That's where the ST elevations are. So these leads look at the inferior wall of the heart. So this is an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. Then these depressions you are seeing there are they what we call reciprocal changes. So they're just opposite changes. So if the wall that is opposite to the inferior wall is the anterior wall. So in the anterior wall, it is seeing the, the leads that look at the anterior wall are seeing that our friends in the inferior wall are infected. There is elevation as there is depression. So it's just showing mirror imaging. That's all it's showing. I hope it's as simple, uh, it makes sense, but you can ask questions later if you want. So within the, the first day or so, you might ECG might be okay, it might be normal. In less than 24 hours, you will see elevation in some leads, you see, like in the inferior leads, there, there is, this is the baseline, the isoelectric line, there's elevation. Even here, there's elevation. And in AV foot, there's elevation. Then in the opposite leads, there's depression or reciprocal changes. So within 24 hours, in less than 24 hours, you get the elevation. By the time you're getting to one to three days, in case the patient comes late, because we also see patients when they come much later because the UTH is the referral center. So by the time they are getting to UTH, so they've been admitted somewhere else for a few days and then finally they send to UTH. So by the time they're coming, we actually see them with the, the scar already forming. So the Q wave has formed. The elevation might still be present, but the T wave also starts to invade. Then late, up to six weeks, the ST elevation would have resolved but there will be a Q wave showing that there was a myocardial injury there and the T wave will be inverted. Then after six weeks, you might even find that the only thing that persists if they had a scar is the Q wave here. So this is the natural evolution of an ST elevation MI. So that's why the timing is so important when you're asking your history, because if the patient tells you that, no, I had the pain, a week ago, then it means that your, S, your, your, your ECG might not show the ST elevation. Then if it was not done, it will show this pattern. But when you see this and you see the myocardial scar there with the Q waves, then you know that, yes, this patient probably had an MI. Let's not miss this. If we can, take, let's take him to the cath lab. We see if we can salvage this myocardium. So I have kind of mentioned it in the ECG that uh, depending on these leads, all the 12 leads, look at the heart in different aspects. So this is what we call the cardiac axis. It's so important. If you understand the cardiac axis, then you understand why this is looking at the inferior wall, why this is looking at the anterior wall, and why this is the lateral wall, V5, V6 is lateral, 
with one and AVL. So all this is looking at the lateral wall of the heart. So depending on which area is my infected, because each coronary will supply a different part of the of the of the of the myocardium. So depending on which part the which coronary is is occluded, you will see the changes in that lead. And then you will see opposite changes in the leads that are opposite to it. So here, if this, for instance, we already saw an example, this is looking at the inferior wall. Two, three, and AV foot. Look at the inferior wall of the heart. The inferior wall of the heart is mostly supplied by the right coronary artery. Okay. A, part, a, a, a branch called the PDA or post uh, uh, posterior descending artery, okay, a branch of the right coronary. So if you see the ST elevations here, you can even tell that, okay, the one that is occluded is most likely the right coronary artery. Then you'd have made your complete diagnosis. So this is something that you can later on study. I told you this is inferior wall. Oh, sorry. How do I go back? Okay. Then that's anterior wall, the lateral wall, okay? So the colors that are similar show you which leads are looking at the, the same wall, the ones that we call contiguous leads. Okay, so I did mention a coronary angiogram. So through catheters, either in the wrist, we're going through the radio artery, or in some patients, you go in through the femoral artery, you advance catheters and wires under aseptic conditions and with a bit of analgesia, local anesthetic. The patient is awake while you're doing this procedure. You advance the catheters into the iota, you put the catheter there, then you inject a dye. You, 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 Go to the right coronary, you engage it, then you inject the dye into the right coronary to look at the lumen of the right coronary to see if it is okay. Okay? So if you can see a dye showing the whole vessel, it means that there is no occlusion. If you went here, for instance, and this is where the occlusion is, you only be able to see when you inject the dye you only be able to see this part, for instance, but not the distal vessel because the, the dye has not gone beyond the blockage. That is self-explanatory. So this is an example. I'll give you an example. Uh, yes. So this is a, during a PCI. So they engaged the right coronary. And when they first injected the dye, it was stopping there. You see how there's a sudden stop in the vessel. The vessel is supposed to look like this. So that is already showing that there's a thrombus there, probably over a, a, an atherosclerotic lesion that has caused occlusion of the whole vessel. So after they put a stent, they injected dye again. After they bypass, they put a wire, then you put a stent in that region, then you inject the dye to see whether it has opened up. Then you can see the rest of the vessel now. So it's as simple as that. Let me go back. So I know for you, it's just uh, clinical features and whatnot, but in medical emergencies, you are actually also supposed to know an outline of treatment for medical emergencies. And acute coronary syndrome is a medical emergency. This is one of those things where if the patient comes in, you even ask for help, you call for help. You should be a team, a team of people taking care of this patient, not just you alone. So the aims of treatment is to, of course, relieve the pain if you can, reduce further myocardial damage because you don't want the infected area because it's, the infection could actually be salvageable. There might just be a lot of ischemia more than just infection, and you can salvage the myocardium, especially when it's done in a timely fashion. And then you also give medications to improve prognosis. But I think I'll concentrate only on the emergency management. So if you have an ST elevation MI, not, not unstable angina, stable angina is just medications and keeping a watchful eye on your troponins. 
But for ST elevation MI, which is what I think I'll concentrate on, urgently you should do a, a, an angiogram and also do a PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention, which is just putting a stent. So there are different types of stents which have got medication on them that you can put for ST elevation MI. But if this is not feasible, like right now, our, our cath lab has been down for more than six months. If this is not feasible, the next best emergency medication you can give if there's going to be a delay is thrombolytics. So thrombolytics, all they do is cause lysis of the thrombus, the one that has formed over the atherosclerotic lesion the one that's causing blockage. So you give drugs to lies or to break down that clot. They are called thrombolytics. And these are the, the types of thrombolytics. I'm sure you learned this in pharmacology. Streptokinase is the one that we usually use, though it's got problems with hypersensitivity. Some people might react to it or something. You also have to look at contraindications. Then the other drugs are alteplase, retoplase, tenecteplase. We have tenecteplase now, but it's so expensive, very expensive. But this is the best drug to use. But if you have streptokinase, it's cheaper. So it's better to just use streptokinase. However, you should know that with every drug that is given, there are um, contraindications. So if this patient had, a, let's say, a hemorrhagic stroke, you would not be giving them. If they had maybe within the last three months a hemorrhagic stroke, you would not be giving them these drugs because you will cause another stroke. So you're, if the patient has got severe thrombocytopenia, you're not going to give them these drugs because it will just make the bleed, to cause them to bleed. And if they have an intracranial bleed, then they, you might lose your patient. So quickly as you're stabilizing them, you're giving them these drugs you have to also ask quick questions or ask yourself, what tests can I do to make sure that these drugs I'm giving are not contraindicated? Then what you expect if you have an ST elevation MI and you give a thrombolytic is that that ST elevation you saw on the ECG should fall by at least 50% within 90 minutes. Then you know that, yes, now our medication is working. If this does not happen, then push for your coronary angiogram. So after that, if you can get a PCI, it's still okay within six hours of thrombolysis or as soon as you can anyway, get a PCI. So this is just a summary of everything that I've been saying before. So here, the patient might, before myocardial infarction, the, the ECG will be looking normal. Remember, I was talking about the isoelectric line. That's the isoelectric line at the base of the P wave. That's the P. This is QRS. ST segment is there. Then that's the T wave. Okay? So if your patient is normal, there is a plaque, but they, there is no problems with ischemia, then you will have a normal ECG. However, during myocardial infarction, when this occludes, where the vessel occludes because there's a thrombus formation at the top there, then the blood cannot go to the distal vessel, then you will get ST elevation. So this is different from this. The ST segment has gone higher up, you see, and there's also a Q wave that has formed now. So now this is at the time when they have chest pain, acute onset of chest pain, ST elevation, myocardial infarction. Then when you're treating, you can advance the catheters, like I said, you advance a wire, sorry, within the coronary, then uh, open it up with a balloon. But most of the times we do is we put a stent directly. So you can do direct stenting. You open up a stent like that. Then it opens up the vessel, pushes all this debris to the side. Then the lumen is open again. Then everything starts to resolve. The ST elevation starts to come down okay i don't know what i've done here anyway i already showed you this picture of the pci with the occluded right coronary artery and this is just a summary again of how a pci is done so it's so important because now we've got all these newer treatments 
it's important that you also know about them so that when you're making recommendations, when you finish your seventh year and you're posted to a rural site, you know that there are better options than just keeping a patient on the ward and giving morphine. So if the patient has got hypoxia, you can give oxygen. Otherwise, it's not recommended that you give everybody. Then the other drugs that you can give are aspirin to chew. Aspirin is very cheap. And it should be given in the emergency ward right there. You give them 300 milligrams, they chew the medicine. It will work uh, properly. Then you give a second antiplatelet, and these are our options, clopidogrel, ticagrel, or prasugrel. Then you also have to give anticoagulants. You can give some pain relief, though it's not advocated for generally in the Western world. They don't even use morphine because by the time the patient is in the hospital, they would have done a PCI and the pain would have gone. So no need for these morphines. But if the patient is going to be on the ward and is in a lot of pain, give them some pain relief. The nitrates, of course, the beta blockers are also are to reduce the myocardial oxygen demand even the calcium channel blockers. These are the calcium channel blockers. Then you also give AC inhibitors and high doses of statins because remember the atherosclerotic lesions have got a lot of lipids in them. Yeah. And then there's also surgical management where you can put a graft to bypass the occlusion. It's called the coronary artery bypass graft. And then don't forget, after you have stabilized your patient, patient has been on the ward, is doing well, ST elevation has gone down, you have to talk to them about lifestyle change, especially in those where you've identified that they are a smoker, they have to stop smoking. It helps a lot. Those who are obese should start managing their weight. Those who take too much alcohol should stop, and then you can start introducing exercise, not vigorous exercise, but in an incremental manner. So the complications are very important of MI because sometimes the patients would have had the chest pain at home and ignored it, didn't even go to the clinic. Then they come in months later with heart failure. It's a complication of MI, one of the complications. They might come in in cardiogenic shock, like we mentioned. Then they could have arrhythmias, they could even have heart blocks. Then if that infection is very large and very severe, the myocardium can rupture. I actually had one patient in 2020, end of 2019, who came in with a myocardial rupture that had ruptured very slowly. They kept him on the copper belt with a myocardial infection without, without treating it for several weeks because the only one doctor said it might be a heart attack, but never treated it, just treated him for heart failure. So he came in with a ventricular rupture, and unfortunately, two weeks ago, he died. The ventricular aneurysm is another complication, and then you can have what we call Dressler's syndrome. You should look this up, please, which is pericarditis that comes after a myocardial infarction. You can even have a pleural effusion, anemia, high ESR, usually it's a, comp a, a complication that comes post-MI about two to six weeks after an MI. So they'll pre complain of chest pain, but it's worse when they are leaning forward. Uh, uh, sorry, they, it's, it's worse when they are, they are lying down. When they lean forward, they feel better. That is uh, pericarditis. That's the pain of pericarditis. And we treat it with colchicine. Then not all chest pain is myocardial infarction. That thing you need to remember, especially if it's severe chest pain. The one that I am very particular about also is aortic dissection. The pain of aortic dissection is very severe. They'll tell you it's severe. It's like a tearing pain. And I feel it between my scapula at the back. That's where the pain is most severe because that's where the dissection is taking place within the aorta. So if you have that, that description, it's better to do your imaging early, like an echo or a CT scan, to make sure that it's not aortic dissection. Because if you start giving things like thrombolytics, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, you make things worse. The patient will bleed to death. The, the aneurysm, the dissection might extend and the patient might bleed to death. 
the other, remember we said that even epigastric pain can be a presentation of myocardial infarction. So acute gastritis can, can mimic a myocardial infarction. You can also have pericarditis. I've already talked about the pain of pericarditis. When you're lying down, the pain is severe. But when you lean forward, the pain is better because the, the, the pericardium is, 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 is separated from the chest wall. So you feel less pain. Then there's pulmonary embolism. This is also a common diagnosis. Can also present with chest pain. Esophagitis can present with chest pain. And then there's such a thing as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. It's a type of cardiomyopathy. I'm sure the person who will teach you on cardiomyopathies will touch on this. But it presents as if it's a myocardial infection. So the, the, it's usually in women, like older women, after emotional stress, they will present with chest pain. That sounds like angina. No, I have this left-sided chest pain. I can't breathe. It's very severe. I just started uh, two hours ago. You check the, the troponins, they are positive. You check uh, ECG, it's typical. But when you do a coronary angiogram, the coronaries are okay. It's called takotsubo because it resembles, a, there's a vessel in Japanese that they use to catch octopus. It looks like a... A, an octopus, the, the myocardium looks, the, the, the heart looks like a, 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 the, the octopus trap, which is called Takotsubo. So it was named after that. I think that's all. Do you have any questions? If there's anything that you want me to just quickly clarify, I can do that. Or is it, uh, was it too much or is it uh, clear? <laughs> um, good morning, Dr. Chansa. Morning. I had a question on the management of STEMI and, and, and STEMI. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, uh, if, uh, okay, you have to, you either get, put the, do the PCI and the CT uh, PA or the, or give thrombolytics, I mean, you give thrombolytics um, within three hours. But then in our setting where the CAD, uh, the echo lab, the, yeah, the lab is, you're saying it's not uh, working not the at the moment. Lab. The, the, the cat oh. lab, the cat lab is different from the echo lab. Or oh, the yeah. cat lab, yes. like where they're not doing PCI and the stenting. Um, yeah. And also if a patient presents maybe, maybe six hours after yeah. the onset of yeah. the symptoms, is, yes. since most of them are referrals, what happens in that? Yeah, that's a great question because that's something that we see all the time. Our patients, are, there is no patient that I have ever encountered that has come within the three-hour period. They usually come much later. In those cases, if they still have ongoing pain, it means that they still have ongoing ischemia. We still go ahead and give them, in our setting, we still go ahead and give them the thrombolytics if they have an ST elevation MI. Remember, the, I, I just talked, I narrowed in on the management of ST elevation MI because that's what I think you should really know. And the end STEMI where there is no ST elevation, you do not give thrombolytics. Now, those ones we just need to, those ones will have to have an angiogram. You give all the other medications, they do antiplatelet therapy. So your aspirin, clopidogrel, you have to give anticoagulants, you have to give, then you give your beta blockers, you give your nitrates and you give uh, uh, AC inhibitors. You can give, you give all those drugs, but the thrombolytics are reserved for ST elevation MI. Oh, okay. So, Thank so you. now, yeah, so we still give in select cases, unless it's several days later and we think there will be no, no, no benefits, the patient is no longer in pain, then they've de already developed a scan, the myocardium is not doing so well, then we might look at that and say it's not worth it even giving the thrombolytics because then what are we treating? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other clarifications? Um, I've got a question. Yes. In 
And in STEM machines, you use the you use an ECG to monitor response to treatment. What about in in STEM? What can you use to yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. No, that that one is a little bit tricky. You 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 just go by the symptomatology, how your patient is feeling. And then also, if it's someone who, for instance, has an enstemy and they finally got a PCI done and they are pain-free, then we know that the patient is okay. Otherwise, there's no real monitoring because there's no elevation there. So there's, you can't really monitor, monitor it, for instance, to see how high the ST elevation is and the response to treatment. So that one is a little bit more challenging. Okay. Yeah. You, you, do you have, oh, sorry, BJ, let me just ask this quick question. Do you have other lectures after this or as in today? We're supposed to have a makeup at 12. Okay, that's at 12. We'll be done way before that. Okay, yes, go ahead with your question. Someone wanted to ask a question before I interrupted. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask a question on the on the pain uh, pain management and the pain. Uh, what medications are used for pain relief besides morphine? Yeah, morphine is the best because the, the pain is usually severe, so you need something strong. You need an opiate. There might be other drugs that can be used, but the, they haven't been validated in, in myocardial infarction, really. The important thing is uh, when you give your medication, your, your, your other drugs properly, there should be no pain, like nitrates. Nitrates are vasodilators. So that could also help indirectly with pain relief. And, and, and if you resolve that... Uh, blockage as quickly as possible that the pain also goes. So it's the emphasis is to save the myocardium and preventing the muscle from dying as quickly as possible. So you, you eliminate ischemia rather than just giving a painkiller. Because even if you give someone morphine, it's not doing anything to resolve that clot that is within the vessel. What you need to do is to deal with that clot. So nitrates will dilate the vessel. It can help deliver more oxygen to the, the distal part that is infected. So that can relieve some pain. Morphine will just be symptomatic just to help in severe cases. But otherwise, the best is to go in, put a stent, and give your other medications that I mentioned, and the patient will be okay. Okay, thank you. But then, having said that, in our setting, because everything is so delayed, don't be surprised if some people still use morphine. Because you don't want your, your patient to be in such severe pain. You're just looking at them and saying, no, they need a PCI. There's no PCI. They need thrombolytics. There are no thrombolytics. And you leave your patient like that. No, give something at least. Give your nitrates. Give them also some pain relief so that your patient is a bit comfortable. The only danger with just giving pain relief without resolving the clot is that you will be fooled into thinking that the patient is okay and you walk away. Meanwhile, the myocardium is dying. So they say time is muscle. So as quickly as possible, if you can resolve that ischemia or in fact the, the ischemia, if you can resolve it, then the better for the myocardium because then your, your heart muscle will not die you will not develop aneurysms, you will not develop heart failure and all those other complications. Okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe we take a last question and then see what next we can do. Maybe there is no other question. So I hope this has been helpful. Fifth year, as I mentioned, the best time to learn emergencies is now. To make things so much easier by the time you are getting to seventh year. As long as you don't forget when you're in sixth year. Or is it still is it still seven years for you? I heard they're changing it to six years. 
Still doing seven. Still doing seven, eh? Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the closures. Yeah. Oh yeah, for, for those closures, forget about them. Okay, so this is the end of this particular lecture. I don't know if you need like a five minutes break, then we can go into the next one. So this one is still free. It's not cutting at 40. Maybe we can continue. Pardon? We just continue. Once we log out, we have to start logging in at 40 minutes. At 40 minutes. Also, you're saying I just continue. Or we can have a, a break while, while, while it was still here. We don't log out. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Then that's... Uh, I don't know. Do you really feel you need a break? Because you have the rest of the day to rest. I think we should just go straight into it because even the internet is a bit unpredictable. We've been lucky so far. There's been no glitches. So I'll try to make the next one as simple as possible because I, yeah, when I was asked, how do I get rid of these red lines? Can you see them as well? Yes. <laughs> I don't know how I did that, but I don't know how to get rid of them. You can uh, end the share and then start. Oh, yeah, just restart, eh? Let's see. Okay. You've disabled the uh, screen sharing, the host. Let me allow you to share. Okay, I think you can share now. Can you see that now? Yes, we can. Okay. So the 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 topic that there was changed to bradycardias. Before I used to take arrhythmias as a whole for your other for the other students, but it was quite bulky because you have to talk about the bradys and the tachycardias. So I think this is actually better that it has been broken down. The only challenge is that. This relies heavy. This top, this particular topic relies heavily on uh, knowledge of the ECG. So in the past, what I would do is teach a bit on the ECG, and then narrow in on the specific arrhythmias that I thought that the students should know the common ones, nothing too fancy, so that you have a base of where to start from. So now with this new format that has been introduced, it's a bit difficult now for me to know when I can talk about the ECG because ideally, to be honest, you actually should have a separate lecture just on the ECG. The ECG is a little bit challenging to remember. You have to do a lot of personal reading as well in the background and teaching it in one session also is also very difficult. So it's a bit challenging for me knowing where to start and where to end. But I think I will try to keep this, this, uh, th this lecture very simple 
so that it just stimulates your appetite for learning the ECG so that you can apply what we learn there. So I don't know if this is acceptable for you. I'll do what I can. I'll talk about arrhythmias in general because you also have to have a general understanding. You will have with another person a, a session on the on the tacky arrhythmias. I'm not going to touch on that. But uh, I don't know. It's, 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 this is how I think we should tackle it a little bit at a time. But if, if, if I had my way, I would actually just teach the ECG today and not teach on the specific arrhythmias yet and then tackle those in a different session. But I don't have a different session. This is all the time I have. So I think after saying that, I hope you understand why it might look like it's very jumpy in the beginning when I'm explaining certain things, but I hope that at the end of it all, things, some things will become clearer to you. So I'll start off generally uh, just talking about arrhythmias. So what is an arrhythmia? An arrhythmia is an abnormal rhythm, okay? We know what normal rhythm is from your anatomy, physiology, you learned the normal rhythm. You learned about the conduction system. So the heart, of course, has got several components. In general, you have, of course, your heart, which is the pump itself with its chambers, the four chambers. And then you also have blood vessels that are connected to them, and blood is supposed to flow very seamlessly within the heart. From the left side, it goes to the rest of your body. From the right side, it receives blood, then pumps that to your lungs, to your pulmonary artery, then through the pulmonary veins, come back to the left side with oxygenated blood, then that goes to the rest of it. So it's supposed to be in a nice synchronous manner for you to maintain perfusion to your brain, perfusion to your kidneys, perfusion to all your vital organs and to the rest of the body. So as long as that pump is working well, then you won't have any issues like hypotension, you won't have issues like, oh, the patient fainted, you won't have issues of problems with cardiac output. So we're not talking about the myocardium today. Myocardial disease is something else. We are concentrating on the conduction system or the electrical system or the wiring of the heart. So as you already know, there's the SA node there, which is the pacemaker. In normal circumstances, it becomes the pacemaker of the heart. So in all of you who are seated here, you are probably all in sinus rhythm. And it's your SA node that is dictating the pace at which your heart is pumping. So there's the SA node at the top there of the right atrium. Then you have depolarization that will go to the left side and to the rest of the right atrium to reach the AV node, which is right there at the junction of the atrioventricular junction in the lower portion of the right atrium. Then there's a bundle of his. And then that bundle of his branches into a left and a right bundle. The left bundle also branches further into a left anterior fascicle and a left posterior fascicle, probably clearer in the next picture. So that's the left posterior fascicle and the left anterior fascicle. And there's also a septal fascicle and then the Purkinje system. So this is just your reminder of the conduction system. So the SA nodes, you, you know that the, the myocardium is a specialized tissue. It can actually, different areas of your myocardium can depolarize on their own without prior stimulation. That's called automaticity. So I think you remember this, this concept from your physiology that your heart can depolarize or the different parts of your myocytes can depolarize without prior stimulation. So this automaticity is uh, is something that is very important to understand. The reason why the SA node is the pacemaker, it's pacemaker, so it sets the pace, that's what it means. So it sets the pace for how, the, how rapidly the heart is discharging, for instance. It's the pacemaker because it's the most dominant and the most rapidly firing. So it suppresses the other potential pacemakers in a, in a phenomenon called overdrive sub suppression. 
So the other tissues are potential pacemakers. So if the heart is diseased, these potential pacemakers, either within the conduction system or within the myocardium, can take over the pacemaker function of the heart. So the other potential text pacemakers are, are referred to as ectopic. These remain as latent or subsidiary pacemakers when the SA node is sick or is not firing for whatever reason, or maybe there is a block, then another pacemaker can take over. But then when that happens, it means that you lose that nice synchronous contraction of the heart that gives you a good cardiac output. It means that things get chaotic within the heart. So the mechanisms of arrhythmias is that you can have a disorder of impulse formation. As I mentioned, maybe an ectopic takes over instead of the SA node, now it becomes somewhere in the ventricle. It starts depolarizing. It will not do as good a job as the pacemaker, which is the SA node. So disorder of impulse formation, or you might have a disorder in the conduction. So a problem within the conduction or a combination of both problem with impulse formation and conduction. So I've already talked about automaticity. They are, the property of a fiber to initiate an impulse without prior stimulation is automaticity. So the problem is that you can have the, either the normal pacemaker, the SA node, that is discharging too fast or too slow. So because our, our, our lecture is on bradycardias, we'll concentrate on it when it's too slow, okay? Or you might have an ectopic pacemaker which starts controlling the rhythm of the heart. I don't, I'll talk about, uh, since I've already talked about uh, how arrhythmias arise, I think I should also talk about this phenomenon called triggered activity, but I like using diagrams. So here's a diagram that you're very familiar with. Remember, this is the action potential of the cardiac myocyte, right? So in this action potential, of course, there are all these phases. There's zero, there's one, and different activities take place. Here there's sodium channels which open, potassium starts going out, then there's calcium which starts coming in to balance out the charge. So you have that plateau of phase two, and then you get phase three and then back to four, and that continues. So this should these activities should take place normally within the cardiac myocytes for you to have a, an orderly way in which the heart is contracting. However, you can have problems within the action potential. So for instance, you see this is normal, what we've already seen, a simplified diagram. Then you start getting these, you see these, the, these, these spikes that are, have started appearing. So these are called after depolarizations, okay? So they can occur in different phases. Of the, of the action potential. So the problem with these after depolarizations is that if they become very prominent, they reach a certain, a certain threshold, they can trigger abnormal electrical impulses. So that is what we call triggered activity. Triggered, so it's been triggered by these after depolarizations, which can occur. So these are abnormal oscillations within the cardiac uh, action potential, which can reach a threshold and cause further electrical activity. This is just a, a little bit more, like here, here is a triggered activity. Now you get all this depolarization. Now it doesn't even look like the normal one, which is this, okay? So the other mechanism, is that you can have re-entry. And actually 90% of arrhythmias are due to re-entry problems. So in a fiber, I'm sure even this, it was there in physiology. Maybe we just need a reminder. A fiber can have uh, a, a slow pathway and a fast conducting pathway. So the impulse reaches there, goes down the fast pathway and the, the slow pathway, and then comes out on the other side. Now, the normal thing is that when you get an impulse there, of course, it will go down the fast pathway fast, right? Then down the slow pathway slowly. So by the time this impulse that went down the fast pathway is reaching this end, 
it will start tracking up the slow pathway and terminates it. So the only one that goes through is the one that went through the past pathway. So this prevents abnormal activity being triggered by this slow pathway. Now the problem, and this is what happens in normal sinus rhythm. You see here, it comes down, the impulse comes down, goes down the fast pathway. By the time it reaches there, it's still coming down the slow pathway as well. So it starts tracking up the path, the slow pathway, and then terminates it. So there's only one impulse that reaches the, the next fiber, and it's done in an orderly fashion. So you get no more sinus rhythm. Now the problem arises when you get an ectopic beat that comes in when the slow pathway, when the fast pathway is refractory. Because remember, there's also a period of refractoriness. After it depolarizes, then it undergoes refraction as if it's resting and resetting itself. Then it's ready to depolarize again. So the problem comes when the fast pathway is refractory. It means that the, path, the impulse will only go down the slow pathway. And the problem is that by the time it reaches the end here, this one is now ready to depolarize. So it starts going back up the fast pathway and then it creates a circular motion, which is here. This is what is known as re-entry. It's actually very simple to understand. It's just as I have explained it. So that is re-entry. So you get a circular motion. So in this case, you get rapid and continuous depolarization. And that is what we, in 90% of tachyarrhythmias or abnormal rhythms with a high fast heart rate, they come from re-entry. Re-entry is the mechanism. So as I mentioned, there are so many arrhythmias that you can describe, so many, but we need to classify them so that we think of them in an organized fashion. So they can be classified according to heart rate. So if you have a high heart rate, you have a tachycardia. If you have a low, a decreased heart rate, you have a bradycardia, okay? Then you can also classify arrhythmias according to the rhythm. Is it regular or is it irregular? Then also depending on where the arrhythmia is coming from. So in the heart, anything that is uh, above at the AV node and above is supraventricular or above the ventricles. Anything that is within the ventricles is, is referred to as ventricular. Sorry, I need to take this call. Hi, can I call you back? I'm in a lecture. I'll, I'll call you back. Okay. So according to the site of origin, if it, the arrhythmia is coming from the atria and above there, it's called supraventricular, supra above the ventricles. Then of course, if it's coming from the ventricles, it's just referred to as a ventricular. So depending on where these, for instance, an ectopic beat is coming from, then you can classify them as either supra or supraventricular or ventricular. Then also you look at the complexes on the ECG, the QRS, are they broad or are they narrow? So this is our area of interest. So if we're going to classify the arrhythmia according to heart rate, a slow heart rate, normal heart rate is between 60 and 100. Some people say up to 90. But in this case, okay, they've given the example of 100. So if you have a heart rate of 60, we, below 60, sorry, then you are described as having a bradycardia. So in bradycardias, it means that most of the times, it's either the SA node is too slow, like in sinus bradycardia, okay? Or maybe there is a block within the conduction system that is slowing the heart rate. And the commonest area where there will be a block is at the AV node. Because remember, the AV node, that's where the normal... AV node delay is supposed to be. But if the AV node is diseased, it starts delaying it too much, too quickly, too, sorry, it starts delaying the, it starts prolonging that delay. Then it means that it will slow down the impulses that are going down to the ventricles. And that is what we commonly refer to as heart blocks or AV blocks. 
I actually prefer the term AV blocks because it tells you exactly where the problem is. Atrioventricular blocks. So the different types, as I've already mentioned, is, for instance, the SA node, if it's dysfunctional, okay? Like in sick sinus syndrome. So it just means that the, sick, the sinus node is sick. So it's called sick sinus syndrome. So you can get an inappropriate sinus bradycardia. So the heart rate is just slow. But if you look at the ECG, there's a P wave, there's a normal QRS, and the rest is normal, except that the heart rate is the one that is slow. Then you get a sinus bradycardia. Then you can have a block at the SA node where the SA node just doesn't discharge. Those are called sinoatrial blocks or sino sinus pauses or sinus arrests. So these, these terms, they are a little bit different, but I won't, really, I won't talk too much about them to avoid confusion. But just remember that at the SA node, it can either pause, you can get a block, or you can get an arrest where it just doesn't discharge. Or it discharges, but it just doesn't leave the SA node. Okay. Then the AV blocks means the blocks at the AV junction can either be a first degree, or we'll talk about that. It could be a second degree one, either more bits one or two, and there's this special one called two to one, or it could be a third degree or a complete AV block. So we'll discuss those. So the different, there are different causes for the apologies, the slide is not very clear. But there are different causes for uh, bradycardias. We've talked about the sinus not just being sick on its own, maybe due to age, maybe due to, to a viral infection that had affected it or caused myocardial problems, yeah? Or disease or degeneration of the conduction system, also age-related is a, is a possible cause. Then coronary artery disease, we already talked about myocardial infarctions and all that. So even those AV nodes and uh, SA nodes have got blood supplies from the coronaries. So if one of them is uh, affected, especially the AV nodes, you will get block, blocks happening there because then the AV node has become diseased because of the coronary artery disease. Or in patients who have got cardiomyopathy, for instance, so if they have cardiomyopathy, you can also have conduction problems. Not always, but you may have them. Then in some infiltrative disorders, these storage disorders, like uh, when you have problems with storage of copper, problems with storage of lead abnormally in the myocardium, or even amyloidosis can cause problems like that. Collagen vascular diseases, then any inflammatory pro process like post my um, viral infections, the coxsackies, echoviruses, all those which can cause uh, myocarditis can also affect your conduction system. And then, of course, also during surgery, for instance, if a patient is undergoing a, a procedure on the coronary arteries and then you damage the, the conduction system, that can also cause the problems. Then there are other extrinsic causes, okay? Drugs. So drugs that will slow your heart rate. We give, for instance, we talked about myocardial infarction. We give beta blockers as part of treatment for angina, okay? We, to reduce the oxygen demand of the myocardium. So we slow down the heart rate so that the, the demands of oxygen are reduced. So we use beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, if you use them in certain patients, they, they can cause a bradycardia. Or if you're using, for instance, beta blockers to control blood pressure, like atenolol, it can slow down your heart rate and even cause heart block if you give too high doses for the patient. Then autoimmune influences, of course, like in diabetics patients who have autonomic dysfunction, you can get that. Electrolyte disturbances, for instance, hyperkalemia, can slow down your heart rate and give you what we call a sine wave, okay? Hypothyroidism is so important because sometimes we get so caught up 
with treat, looking at the bradycardia and trying to treat it without trying to find out what the underlying cause is. So the reason why we're going through all these causes is so that in your mind, if you see a patient like that you are, who you are clicking with a bradycardia, you should always ask yourself questions. Is it drugs? Is it the my, myocarditis? Is it a, a coronary artery disease? Because you, once you treat those, then it becomes easy. Then it means you have solved more than half the problem. So hypothyroidism can give you bradycardia. And then patients with stroke, this one is very interesting. Can anyone tell me how a stroke can cause bradycardia? Or any intracranial bleed, for instance? Can anyone think of something? Okay, they, I don't know if you... Yes, go ahead. I was thinking of Cushing reflex. Exactly, excellent. Cushing, Cushing effects, okay? So the Cushing reflex, what do you get? You get a bradycardia, and then you get what? Hypertension. So Cushing reflex is due to raised intracranial pressure. So anything that will give you raised intracranial pressure will cause your, your, your BP to go high, but your pulse to, to go down, your heart rate to go, go down. So that's how a stroke, for instance, if you had a large intracranial bleed due to a hemorrhagic stroke can cause that. So here you see the intracranial pressure, okay? And then hypothermia can cause it. In some cases of sepsis, you can also have that. And then in people who are athletic, you know, the heart becomes so conditioned, it doesn't have to beat so many times for it to give you an adequate cardiac output because you are so well-trained as an athlete, your heart rate can be low. So that would be normal for an athletic person. It may be normal. Most of the times you find maybe the heart rate is around 54, 52. You ask them, do you have any, any and they come for routine checkups for their heart. You ask them, do you feel dizzy? Have you ever fainted? Nothing. No, I'm feeling fine. I actually play soccer three times in a week and especially over the weekends. So then that's just an athletic heart. So please, these are all the potential causes. Eh? So what are the symptoms? Why is bradycardia so terrible? Your heart is supposed to, remember that your cardiac output is a, is a, is a factor of your heart rate and your stroke volume. So in this case, in bradycardia, what is affected is your heart rate. So if your heart rate goes down, it will affect your cardiac output. So if it becomes so compromised that your perfusion to your brain is uh, compromised, then it will cause lightheadedness, dizziness, and dizziness. And then the patient might even have a pre-syncope or syncope or loss of consciousness. So depending on how severely bradycardic you are, it can affect perfusion perfusion to everywhere, but mainly to the vital organs. And the most important one here in this case is your brain, okay? Then, of course, the patient will give you, may give you reports of being fatigued. No, I even fainted the other time. Then I also have problems breathing. That's dyspnea, shortness of breath, okay? So if the patient had an MI, they might also give you a history of chest pain that's very important because then it means you need to treat the mi once you treat the mi in some cases the bradycardia can even resolve and then they might also report some episodes of confusion so of course the signs are just depending on what the underlying cause are so if, for instance, you have a patient who is uh, an athletic patient, you might not find anything abnormal except for just the heart rate, which is low. Okay, when you check your pulse and you you listen to the heart and you you listen to how how fast it's beating. Okay, if a patient has got uh, hypothyroidism, it means that you have to look for the other features of hypothyroidism: myxedema. Do they have an enlarged uh, goiter? you know, and all the other features. There's their mentation a bit slow during their illness and all that. 
And of course, you do tests to find that out. Then in some cases, they might actually present with a low BP as, as, as well, or hypotension. If, however, the BP is high, we've already talked about Cushing effect, look for problems in the cranium, intracranial problems, especially your history will also give, point you more towards the CNS cause then you can investigate and treat that. Once you treat that, all those things will resolve. Okay. So this is another emergency that I think is worth uh, talking about briefly how we manage it. So the treatment really depends on the underlying cause. If you have a treatable cause, treat that cause. So if, for instance, your patient has been on digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, that's a recipe for, for complete heart block. So if you find the patient is bradycardic like that because of those, the simple thing is to take them off the medication and observe them closely, maybe even do temporary pacemaker, but keep them ob under observation and see if you removing the offending factor is actually going to help resolve them. Or if they have hypothyroidism, puts them on, uh, on thyroxine, replace the thyroid hormones, see if they're going to improve. If they have a myocardial infarction, treat the myocardial infarction properly and thoroughly and see if the bradycardia resolves. However, in the emergency setting, where the patient comes in with a low heart rate, heart rate 30, and you think they have a complete heart block, for instance, then you need to do emergency management in this case. And as usual, airway, breathing, circulation. That's the thing we also, I talked about emergency management, but I didn't emphasize airway, breathing, circulation. Or is it circulation? These days it's circulation, air, airway, and then breathing. Actually, it's the other way. So in, even in myocardial infarction, just remember that there's also that part of resuscitation, okay? In some patients who are hypoxic, you may give oxygen then do an ECG because the important thing is to find out now what the rhythm is. I can tell just by examining the patient's pulses that she has bradycardia and the heart rate is 36 beats per minute. But I want to know what type of bradycardia the patient has. So you do an ECG, okay? Then, of course, you do the other measures like using a pulse oximeter and give put IV access in case you have to give of course, you might have to give uh, IV drugs to help. So if the patient is poorly perfused, then you go straight to just putting a pacemaker, either a transcutaneous one, transvenous one, temporary or permanent, depending on what the, the cause is. But if they are adequately perfused, just keep them in a high dependency area of course, you have to monitor and observe them and then check if the reason why they have, for instance, uh, a cardiac arrest is any of these and any of the other causes that we have talked about. Maybe this one is even better. Then, of course, we also might give atropine, dopamine or epinephrine if the heart rate is too slow. You don't have to bother with the doses and all that at, that at this level. So I think we can talk about just generally, as I mentioned pacemakers, but this is an example of a permanent pacemaker also being done in our cath lab when it is functional, but not, not currently, okay? So a pacemaker, all that it is, because remember, if you had the complete heart block, you've ruled out all these causes that like he drugs, hypothyroidism, myocardial infarction, you've ruled those out. But the patient still has a low heart rate of 36. And you know, at any point, they can even just suddenly stop, the heart can stop beating. You want to prevent that. And the only way to do that safely and permanently, if, if a patient has a complete heart block, and let's say it's, you think that it's due to de just degeneration of the conduction system, then you need to put in wires of what we call leads, electrodes or leads. You put leads in the heart. So these start acting like your conduction system, okay? So you put one lead in the atria, in the right atrium, a second lead in the right ventricle. 
So this is the what what we call the box or the pulse generator. So it, it generates impulses from there. It's got a it's a battery, okay? It's got a battery. So this generator will start pacing your heart. It will produce an electrical impulse which goes to your atria, your atria contracts. Then after a set time, it sends to the left, right ventricle, the ventricles contract. Then you maintain an adequate cardiac output. You set the rate to normal physiological rate. So you can even start off by putting it at 60 beats per minute. So it will start pacing at 60 per minute, okay? So it's taken over the function of the SA node, taken over the function of the his bundle and the bundle branches. So it's, it's the one now, this is the one that is pacing the heart. So your heart rate will improve. And as long as it's being done in a synchronous manner like that, you've, you've done your settings very well, then it means that you'll be able to maintain a good cardiac output. The newer pacemakers, if a patient has got a fever where you need a higher heart rate or if the patient is exercising, goes, decides to go for a jog or is climbing upstairs, or any, any condition that will require that his heart rate should increase physiologically as well, then it's able to sense. It's got what we call rate responsiveness. It's also able to sense those activities and increase the heart rate. So the kind of patient remains very comfortable because this has taken over the pace, the, the conduction system of, of, of your, your heart. Okay. I hope that's clear. That's generally as simply as I can put it. That's the role of, of pacemakers and pacing. So if you did x-rays, you might find a few patients where they've even done an x-ray to see how they have placed the leads within the within the, the heart. So these are the leads going through the cephalic vein all the way to the right side of the heart. That's already in the right atrium. This is the right atrium. So there's this lead in the right atrium. And then there's another lead there that has gone down to the right ventricle. Don't be confused by this thing. This one is just an electrode. You know those ECG uh, electrodes? This is, this is this line here. You see, it's attached to the heart because it's supposed to be monitoring the way the heart is beating as well during your, as, you, as you take care of the patient and do these procedures. So those are the two leads. One has gone to the atrium, one has gone to the ventricles. There are some older ones that they just used to use to pace the ventricles without pacing the atria. And those ones are also useful in atrial fibrillation because it's useless having the atrial lead. You just need the ventricular one. But this one is what we call a dual chamber. So dual chamber because it's going to the atri right atria and also to the right ventricles. So it's going to the two chambers on the right side. Okay. So this is called a dual chamber pacemaker. We can have a more detailed uh, lecture on devices. Maybe when it starts functioning, you should even go and see how they put the leads and also see how they pace the, the pacemaker. Look at the coding for the pacemakers. What does a DDDR pacemaker mean VVI, R pacemaker, AAI, R pacemaker. The, it's different nomenclature and different terminologies. Just out of interest, of course, you are, you are never going to be examined on things like that in medical school, later in life, of course. So I think we'll end here because even talking about uh, the ECG, this, I used to teach them, it used to be a long lecture. I would go into the ECG and all that, but I think well, let's just concentrate on bradycardias, okay? So the contraction of the heart should be synchronous. Blood comes in nicely, then goes to the ventricles, then out to the rest of the body in a nice synchronous fashion. Bradycardias just look at the slowness of the heart. We've already talked about them. I will not talk about uh, tachycardias. So this is a normal ECG, okay? The, the strip that we like looking at and we encourage students to really know very well is lead two because lead two shows a lot of things, 
okay this is a long lead too you see it's from the beginning there to the end there so this lead too will show you a nice p wave will show you a q r s then a t wave then again it starts p q r s t as you can see from this it's coming in a very regular fashion is it not if we had the paper to measure here the distance between these qrss it's equal okay so it's regular what about the heart rate what is the heart rate i'll teach you how to how to measure the heart rate there are several ways you can do that you see between the r waves there there are these big boxes you count them then you do 300 over the number of big boxes between the r intervals so here you have maybe one, one, two, three, almost four complete ones. So it will be 300 over four. That gives you a heart rate of 75 beats per minute. That is assuming that this is at standard speed. The standard speed of an ECG is 25 millimeters per second. Let me show you another one, maybe which is the, yes. So the speed is written at the, at the bottom. In that one that I showed you, it didn't have, but I'll show you one which has. It always will give you the speed. It's always standardized. So here it's written speed 25 millimeters per second. What that it means is that every in the x-axis, every 25 millimeters represents one second. Okay? So every 25, this big box, is five millimeters. One, two, three, four, five, five, where is it? Here. One, two, three, four, five. This is graduated as a millimeter to make things easy for us, okay? So it means that five of these big boxes will give you 25 millimeters, won't it? So that represents one second. That's what it means. So if you are going to change the speed, it means that even the way you, you memorize, you say that if, if 25 millimeters represents one second, then what does this one millimeter here represent? It's simple mathematics. It will be one over 25, which is 0 0.04 seconds. So I'm sure when you learned the ECG, they were telling you, each small box is 0 0.04. It is derived from this speed, which is used in most labs the world over. So this small box is 0 0.04 seconds. So even when you're memorizing that no PR interval from the beginning of P to the beginning of to, to the, the beginning of R, the PR interval should not exceed 0 0.2. It's between 0 0.12 and 0 0.2 milliseconds. Then what you're saying is that it shouldn't exceed five small boxes because five times 0 0.04, which is one box, will give you 0 0.2. Or the QRIS should not be more than 0 0.1 or 0 0.08 seconds. So it means that it should not be broader than two small boxes. That's what you're saying. Have I lost you there? If you need me to repeat this later at the end, I'll do that, okay? It's so important for you to just understand that it's actually very simple. The answers are actually in front of you. You don't have to memorize anything, okay? So that's why there are all these normal ranges that when you look in your books for ECG, they'll give you normal ranges. They, are, they derived from these same things. As long as you know what one small box represents, then you'll be able to calculate. It's simple mathematics. It's just, okay, how many small boxes? There are, there are five small boxes. So it means that that represents five times 0 0.04 seconds. So it represents 0 0.2 seconds. So my PRI interval is normal. So if the PRI interval is normal, it means that there's no first degree heart block. Okay? So that's how you can make your inferences. So we've already talked about heartbeat. Normal is 60 to 100. 
above 100 is tachycardia, below 60 is bradycardia. So I want to go into the, we've already talked about the rate. So this is what I was talking about. The rate is 300 over the number of large squares between the R waves. That's how you, you get the rate. This is so important. Or the other way is that you can use the small boxes between the R waves, but in that case, it means that you have to divide it in 1,500. Can someone please mute? Can someone please mute their, yeah. Okay, so it's either you, when you're counting the small boxes between the R waves, you use 1,500. It will give you the same number as if you use 300. Or you multiply, if you have a rhythm strip, you multiply by six. What I mean is, from the beginning of the ECG, here, if you have a rhythm strip, this is a rhythm strip, okay? From the beginning here of this ECG tracing, as long as it's moving at 25 millimeters per second, it will reach the end here in 10 seconds. Now we are not, so it means that you have so many ventricular contractions or so many heartbeats in that 10 seconds, right? So it means you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12. So there are 12 heartbeats in 10 seconds. But our heart rate is measured in a minute and the minute is 60 seconds. So to get to 60 seconds, it means that you have to multiply this by six because here it's only representing 10 seconds. So for 60 seconds, if it's the same thing is happening for 60 seconds, you have to multiply by six. So 12, which you have counted here, by 6, which gives you 72. So it means that the heart rate is 72 beats per minute or 72 beats per 60 seconds. That's your heart rate. If there's anything that you should take away from this lecture, this particular one, about the ECG is knowing how to at least count the heart rate. It will save your patients. I was impressed once with a sixth year student who brought me an ECG because I always send sixth years to do ECGs themselves so that they learn how it's done and it things stick much better in your brain. You don't have to memorize too much, even access you don't have to memorize when you've done the ECG yourself. So this, this, this particular student did an ECG and then I sat down to have a session with them on the old ECGs. And then she said, no, but doc, you are, saying, you are talking about the heart rate. There's one patient who we've just seen and we've sent her home. Her heart rate is 35. So I said, no, but how? How can you send a patient home with a heart rate of 35? Have you tried, have you evaluated her? No, she hasn't been evaluated. So we had to start searching for this patient who luckily had gone to the lab. We found her, admitted her, she had a complete heart block. She had had syncope before. She just came to the echo room for an ECG. The person who was doing the ECG with the students just did the ECG, gave the ECG to this patient, told the patient to pay. The patient paid and the patient was sent home. So this student saved this patient's life because this patient needed a pacemaker. All from knowing just how to count, how to, how to, how to determine the heart rate on an ECG. Isn't that fantastic? It is. Yeah. So we've already talked about normal sinus rhythm. P before every QRS is normal sinus. The heart rate should be normal. It should be between 60 and 100, not lower than 60, not faster than 100. It should be regular. The QRS should be there be, uh, after every P. That's sinus. The PRI interval, normal is 0 0.12 to 0 0.2, or at least four, five, sorry, five small boxes from the beginning of P, if you count to there, it should be like that. 
and the QRS should be nice and narrow. So that's a normal one, okay? And by the way, I, for simplicity's sake, I only took lead two. So this is lead two. Okay. I won't go into cardiac access. This is all the things that I used to teach. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let's look at sinus bradycardia. In sinus bradycardia, it's self-explanatory. It's in sinus rhythm. So there's a, an upright P in lead two an upright P before every QRS. P before every QRS. P before every QRS. So it's sinus rhythm, okay? But is, it, is the heart rate okay? If you count the number of big boxes here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The heart rate here is around 36 beats per minute. Is that normal? It's not. It's below 60. So it's a bradycardia. So because she's in sinus with him and there's a bradycardia, it's a sinus bradycardia that the patient has. So if you have a patient like this, of course, you're going to go through the whole system of asking questions. Do you get uh, dizzy? Have you ever fainted or lost consciousness? Do you feel weak? Do you feel breathless? Then you go to start determining whether are you on bitter blockers by any chance or digoxin or calcium channel blockers on your medications? What medications are you taking? You check any of the medications if they can affect your heart rate. You ask for thyroid symptoms. You ask for symptoms of heart attack. Okay? Then if they have none of those, then you say that we need to really know whether this is just a problem with the conduction system. They fibrosis or something, maybe in an older patient, or if there's something else. So that's with your sinus bradycardia. If it's severe and the patient is symptomatic, no, I fainted. I fainted three times this week. I was just seated and all of a sudden I fainted. Then you can do what? You can, the treatment ultimately should be a pacemaker. You put a permanent pacemaker like I, I mentioned to you, where now the electrodes start to take over the, the electrical activity of the heart. However, if they have no symptoms, then these are patients you can observe. And of course, if there's a reversible cause, reverse that cause. Stop those drugs that are causing bradycardia. Treat the MI, treat the thyroid disease, then everything might resolve. So that's for sinus bradycardia. In the next bradycardia I wanted to talk about is this one. So this one is also a lead too. But look at it step by step, very simply. Start from here. Are we in sinus with it? There is a P. Then next is a QRS and a T wave. Okay. Next there, there is a P. Then a QRS. Then a T wave. Then all of a sudden, where you expect to see a P, there is nothing. The, si the, the sinus node has stopped firing. So this is what we call a sinus arrest. Then after a while, this long pause here, it starts again. P, QRST. Here there's a small P, QRST. So here there was what? A dropped beat. Because there's even no P, it means that it's a sinus node area. That's where the problem is, okay? So sinus arrest. So these cases, sometimes in some patients, the sinus node can be so diseased, like in sick sinus syndrome, can be so diseased that uh, the pauses are so long. During this time, your heart is not beating. So what do you do? Syncope. So if that happens in a patient where you know it's not external factors you can correct, put a pacemaker. So sinus arrest, sinus pause, almost the same things. Then the next one that I want to talk about, which is the last one, don't worry, we are almost at the end. I hope you're not getting, uh, you're getting something from this lecture. So the heart blocks. The block 
we have talked about the block at the sinus node, but what about the block at the uh, AV nodes, atrioventricular node, at the junction between the atria and the ventricles? Okay. So in first degree AV block, it just means that at the a, the AV node is disease, but not so much. And that's the simplest way I can say it. So there is a normal delay in a normal person. There is a there is a few milliseconds of delay when the impulse reaches the AV node before it can send it to the ventricles, right? Now, if this delay is prolonged because the AV node, for instance, is diseased or it's interfered with by drugs and hypothyroidism or whatever other factors we've already talked about, then it might be delaying sending the impulses to the ventricles represented by the QRIS. QRIS is for ventricular contraction, right? P wave is atrial contraction. So the atria contracts, then send the impulses down to the AV node. The AV node, there's a delay. This is the delay. from The, from the PRI interval represents the delay. Then reaches the ventricles and then the ventricles contract producing a QRIS. Now if you have a, a prolonged PRI interval then it's first degree AV block. So the P wave is coming, QRS is coming, T wave is coming. P wave comes, QRS, T. It's nice and, and, and orderly. Okay. The only difference is that when you measure the intervals, the only thing that is prolonged is your PRI interval. So from here, from the beginning of P, you count the number of boxes, then multiply by 0 0.04 seconds, and it's more than 0 0.2. And that's the only abnormality here. Then that's a first degree AV block. Now this block can become more serious. It can go into what we call a second degree one. Now, a second degree one is that what happens is that in the first one called Mopids one, you get your P, your QRS quite all right, T. P, QRS, T. But do you notice that the P here and the QRS is shorter, the PRI interval is shorter than here. So slowly it's getting prolonged. So it's like the AV node is progressively becoming tired because it's diseased. Then all of a sudden you get a P, but there's no QRS. So it, it has blocked at the AV nodes, the impulse has been blocked. It's not going down to the ventricles. So that's why you don't get the QRS here. Then all of a sudden it starts, it, it, it rests and resets itself. Then starts again, P, QRS, it seems to be okay. T, then P, then here it's, it's also longer than it was there. So it's progressively, the PRI interval progressively becomes longer until there is a dropped beat. So there's no QRS here. That is a, a second degree morbid type 1 or called Wenkeback. So progressively in, in morbid 1, remember, in the first one we described, there were no dropped beats. The QRS was still for coming. It's just that the AV node was tired, so it was just discharging, releasing the impulse at a, 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 a slower rate. So the PRI interval was longer. But second degree, there are times when it even just doesn't send the impulse. So you get what we call dropped dropped beats. So here there's a dropped beat. There's no QRS, so it has been dropped. Even here there's supposed to be a QRS, it has been dropped. So those are dropped beats. That's going back. In second degree AV block, more beats type 2, it's more serious. Because there, there is even no warning sign that the PRI interval is getting longer. There's no warning that the, the, the AV node is uh, getting fatigued, to put it in layman's terms. It's just, it looks normal. Then all of a sudden, it just drops it. That's more dangerous. Here, there's, it's normal. QRS comes in. Then there, it just drops it. 
it just doesn't send to the to the ventricles. So it means that the, the block is more severe. It's a morbid type two. The importance of recognizing these different types is that your treatment will be different. In here, by the time the patient is getting a morbid type two, they need a pacemaker. For morbid type one, it's also a second degree AV block, but there's no need for pacemaker here. You can just closely observe them and remove any factor that can cause this, which we've already discussed. First degree AV block also, you just observe. You don't do much. And, but the most, the worst now is the third degree. So imagine at the AV node, the atria, the AV node. Let me go to a picture. Do I have a picture? Then I can explain it better. Okay, I'll use this one, though it's not the best. Forget all these things. Okay, so there is your AV node, right? SA is there, AV is here. So imagine if there's a complete AV block. What does it mean? It means that there'll be, there'll be depolarizations reaching here, so there'll be a P wave. Here there's no problem. Isn't that true? As long as there's no problem anyway. So there's no problem here. So the P wave will depolarize, the, the atria will depolarize, a P wave will be seen on the ECG. But the problem is that these impulses will not be going down to the ventricles. So what happens? Remember what I was saying that if the one of the mechanism of arrhythmias is that when you when the SA, when the myocardium, the ventricles, for instance, think that they don't get an impulse from higher up there, which they are used to getting from their pacemaker, which is the SA node. It's not getting any impulses. So one of them takes over the function. It's like in society. You see that there is no leader here. You people who are overzealous, you say, no, me, it's me who will take over this function. So an ectopic focus in the ventricle now starts discharging as if it is the pacemaker. So it starts discharging to depolarize. It's a safety mechanism because without contraction of the ventricles, then the patient is dead. There will be no heartbeat, no cardiac output, right? The patient will die. So it's a, it's, a, it's a protective mechanism that one of them takes over the pacemaker function. So here the atria will be discharging, saying, no, us, we're doing our job. But here, there's a block. It's, it's stopping the impulses from coming down. So an ectopic focus takes over. So on the ECG, the way it looks is that the atria, the P wave will be coming on their own at their own rate regularly because there, there is no problem. You see, that's P, P. Let me start here. P, P, P. P regularly, it's hidden here, P, P, okay? So these arrows here are showing you the P waves. But if you look at the, the normal relationship we are used to, like here it looks like the, it's in relation, as if it has gone nicely to the ventricles. But here, there's nothing. So there's a dropped beat there. Then here, P wave, where's the QRS? It's coming, it's not even in relationship to it because it should come here at this distance. Now it's longer. Now it's dropped. Then here it's coming very close to the QRS. So it means that there's no communication between the atria and the ventricles at the rate at which they are contracting or the way they are depolarizing. So this is what we call atrioventricular dissociation. So there's a dissociation between the atria and the ventricles. That's all that it means. Atrial ventricular dissociation. That's the first sign of a complete heart block. Then now, the simpler things. Imagine if you had this ECG and you all you knew was just how to count the heart rate. That will also save you, right? Because look at the number of big boxes between the arrow waves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 300 over 8, the heart rate is somewhere approaching 30 or even in the 20s. So if the heart rate here is 30, and you look at these QRSs, they are big, broad, and bizarre. 
it means that it's, it's coming from the ventricles. So this is a ventricular ectopic that is discharging. The heart rate is 30. There is AV dissociation because the atria are contracting on their own without uh, any relationship to the ventricles. This is a complete heart block. So that student that I, I have praised, the only difference is that he, she just never made the diagnosis of complete heart block, but she was close because she, she talked about the rates being very low. So this is a complete heart block. Please, you see a patient like this walking around, stop them. Admit them. Investigate them for correctable causes. If there are no correctable causes, whatever the case, immediately this patient without thinking should have a pacemaker. Because once these ventricles, this ectopic stops discharging, there will be no ventricular contraction. That would be it. Your patient will suddenly die. It will suddenly collapse. So that's a complete AV block. I like this. I'll end on this note. This is the last ECG you are going to look at. This ECG, can somebody tell me what they see? From the very simple things that I have, I have taught you on the ECG from, from yesterday, not yesterday, it's from the earlier lecture to now. What is it that you see? Just anyone, don't worry, there are no wrong or right answers here that we are worried about. We, we just, we are here to learn. Yes, yes. There is elevation in lead two. Yes, is it just in lead two? Uh, also three. Yes. Um, seven one degrees. And foot. No elevation. Let's let's go with the elevations first. One in two, three, and AV foot. You see that ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation, okay? This is also a long lead two. This is a long lead two, but this is also just a part of lead two. So two, three, and AV foot have ST elevation, okay? So ST elevation, I agree with you. Very good. I'm very happy you picked that up. And I'm happy that you also started talking about these depressions. These are reciprocal changes or opposite changes, showing you that in the, in in if you see this without seeing this without seeing this part, if you see this, you will say there must be elevation somewhere because this is a wall opposite the inferior wall. So this is the inferior wall showing ST elevation. So you will not label this patient as N N S T M I. You will label them as S T M I because you've seen the elevations, right? ST elevation, myocardial infarction. So you do cardiac enzymes here. If they are positive, then you've made your complete diagnosis. ST elevation, myocardial infarction. Now what's about, here is the long lead too. What about the heart rate? What is your comment on the heart rate? There is an R. Uh, that's another R. Uh, Number of big boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost eight. 300 over eight. How much is that? It's still heart rate in almost close to, to the 30s, right? You can agree with me that this patient is definitely bradycardic. Yes. Yes. Then let's look for a relationship between the P and the QRS. There it looks like there's a P, then a QRS, the interval must be okay. Then there's a P, it's prolonged here, then it comes. Then here there's a P, if you look at this here, it's becoming progressively longer, QRS. Then here there's a P and no QRS. Then another P. The relationship is not very clear. There is AV dissociation here. And already the heart rate of 30-something already gives you a clue that this is also a complete heart block. 
So this complete heart block in this patient was caused by the myocardial infarction, the inferior myocardial infarction. So in that case, you means that you would have made your complete diagnosis. You are going to treat. Now this, we are marrying our lectures now. We're going to treat the MI the way we know how to treat from the beginning. Then we are also going to put the patient or potentially consider putting a pacemaker for the complete heart block. Then you, if you are intern in the emergency ward and you have told me that, that I have this patient I need your help with, and this is what I think is going on, then you have saved this patient. I think I'll end here. This is a very nice place to end. Any questions? Dr. Chansa, yeah. can you kindly go through this one? I didn't understand. I was Which one? Which one? This same one. Oh, this ECG. Yes. Okay. I had asked. I asked somebody to tell me what they see, and they rightly said they can see ST elevations. Do you agree? Stay yes. online. You can agree, right? Yes. So it's there in lead two, lead three, and AV foot. Now these depressions that you're seeing all the way here. V1 all the way to V3, V4, V5, V6. These are just opposite changes of what is going on in the in this wall, which is the inferior wall, 2, 3, and AV foot, where the elevations are. So in this patient, if the, you see an ECG like this and the history is typical of angina, and it's also, you, you are going to label this patient as having an ST elevation, myocardial, infarction but it doesn't just end there because if you look at the, this is a lead two it's a long lead two okay so let's go to lead two you can even use this one but it's too short but this, this one is probably better so we're looking for a relationship first first we we're looking at the heart rate and we counted the number of big boxes here divided 300 over the number of big boxes over about eight big boxes gives you a heart rate in the 30s, okay? Or at least 30 something. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So already 30 yeah. something. Imagine if you or your heart rate was 30 something. Would you be okay? Very sick. No. Yeah. Already that's your first clue that there's something more serious going on. Then you look for a relationship but the P waves in good relationship no interval here it's different here there's even a dropped beat different from here so there is a atrial ventricular dissociation okay there's an appearance then it's at the AV junction where the AV node is so association it was a complete heart block. Yes. So the complete diagnosis here is an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction with the complete heart block. So we have to treat for both. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Doctor, is it okay if you go through Mobit 2 heart block again? Mobit 2, okay, that's fine. Okay, one is clear. One is just prolonged PRI interval, right? First degree, rather. Yeah. The PRI yes. interval is the one that is prolonged. That's all. And we said this one you don't treat normally, okay? The second degree has got two types. There is this one called Mobitz 1 or Wenkeback. And then there is a Mobitz 2. Mobitz 1 is better than Mobitz 2. Mobitz 1, the PR, the PR interval progressively becomes longer. If you 
if you look at it, even just by looking without counting, you can see there. This is shorter, then it gets longer. And then there where it's supposed to come, it completely drops. So the AV node, here it will transmit to the ventricles, ventricles contract, because the problem is not with the at the side of the ventricles, at least in the conduct, it's not even at the his bundles or the bundle branches, no. So it will contract, okay. The impulse has reached it, so it has to contract. T wave. Then the P wave comes. Then at the AV node, because it's got some form of disease or dysfunction, or maybe it's drugs, we don't know, it's taking too long, a bit longer than before. So it's like it's progressively becoming fatigued. Now you become so tired that you don't even transmit at all. So progressive prolongation of the PRI interval, and then you get a dropped beat. There's supposed to be a QRS here. Then it starts again. It's, it's like it rests, then starts again. But it's still getting fatigued. There it's longer. Then it stops. It does, it, there's a dropped beat there. This is what we call Wenkebach. So if you looked at the heart rate here, it would be very slow, slower than here, right? Yes. Yeah. So progressively, PR interval becoming longer. So that's this one here. PR interval progressively longer. That's it. The morbid one, or Wenkebach. Now for the second degree one, there, there is even no warning. Most of the times, there's even no warning sign that the AV node is diseased. It transmits, QRS is okay, T wave, then it comes P, then all of a sudden it drops a QRS without giving you any warning that it's progressively becoming fatigued. That is more serious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, let me also give you an example in society. Eh? The person who you know at Uwafita allow you, if you give them a task to do, they might reluctantly do it. And then one day they won't do it. So they're a bit unpredictable. There are sometimes they'll do it. They might be inefficient, slow at doing it. But eventually, maybe one day they'll just stop and not do it. Then start all over again. And then if the person who you think that's, oh, this one will do it, and then they just don't do it, who is more dangerous? Because you didn't give me a warning. At least the person who is it difficult to deal with? I knew that you were difficult. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is a good enough example. But anyway, just remember, here there, is no, there might be no PRI interval begin, becoming longer. It might either be normal or long, but it doesn't give you any warning that it is progressively becoming longer. It just drops a bit. Even there, it just drops a bit. You see, here it looks normal. Then there, it just drops a bit. This is dangerous. So in morbid type 2, second degree AV block, these ones will put a pacemaker. Because we don't know. It's so unpredictable. The, 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 the bradycardia here is unacceptable. Look at that. With no QRIS. So such a patient might actually have syncope, episodes of syncope. All right, thank you. It's clear. I hope it's clearer now. Don't worry. Yes, it Sometimes is. it takes a while. You might forget tomorrow, but once you read it, you remember. Just make sure that you are reading them so that you, you never forget them. So there are three degrees. First degree, second degree has got two types, more bits one and more bits two, and then there's third degree AV block. Okay. Any last question? Burning question. Or simple question. Okay, Madam Moderator. It looks like we are okay. I've taken longer than I should have, but I think it was worth taking the time because I know for students, even after this lecture, you still haven't learned everything about the ECG, but I hope the basics just become comfortable with knowing regular or not on the QRSs, 
get comfortable with heart rate calculations, get comfortable with knowing when there's ST elevation, when the T waves are inverted, when there's ST depression. Those are simple things. Just get comfortable with those first and then the other more advanced things will come later. Okay, that's my advice to you. Okay, Madam Moderator. I think we're ready to close off now. Oh, Dr. Chance, uh, I wrote you a direct message. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, a message on the chat. Yes.